Could getting a blister on your foot be the most important, valuable thing that ever happens to you as a runner? Crazy as that sounds, we're going to be taking a look today on today's episode of the Movement Movement Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about having a happy, healthy, strong body. We're going to be breaking through the mythology, the confusion, sometimes the propaganda and outright lies about what it takes to walk, run, hike, do yoga, paddleboard, lift, anything you can think of, and to do that more enjoyably. I am here, Stephen Sashin, your host for the Movement Movement Podcast, and we call it the Movement Movement because we are creating a movement, making natural movement the obvious better healthy choice the way natural food currently is and if that sounds like something that you're interested in or could be provocative uh, then subscribe follow share do all those things you know how to do just find us online at www.jointhemovementmovement.com that'll point you to everywhere you can engage with us facebook youtube twitter itunes etc etc so let's jump in i'm going to tell the story to start of my important blister and it goes kind of like this so back in 19 i don't even know what year year that was i can't do years let's just say it was 11 years ago because that's true about 11 years ago i got back into sprinting after a 30-year break and i was getting injured pretty much constantly and one day a friend of mine who's a world champion cross-country runner suggested that i try running barefoot to see what i would learn from doing that just happened that that weekend there was a workshop being put on by a guy named michael sandler about barefoot running and i joined the workshop and took my first barefoot run. Now, I'm a sprinter. I run the 100 meters. I do not take turns on the track. I don't know what the other side of the track looks like. My friends tease me. They say that I have a phobia of the other side of the track, but that's ridiculous because how can you be afraid of something that doesn't exist? So suffice it to say, I run very short distance in a very straight line, very fast. That's it. I think the longest I had ever run, and definitely not of my own volition, was maybe a mile and a half. That was uh, when I was working with this one particular coach, and man, I did not like any bit of that. Uh, So I go out for my first barefoot run on this workshop and we're running on grass and on pavement and on sidewalks and on trails and over wooden bridges, everything you could think of. And it undeniably wasn't fast, but it was really fascinating. I was transfixed by the experience of just seeing what would happen if I moved my body differently, if I moved my legs faster or slower without changing my speed, if I changed my speed without moving my legs faster or slower, if I landed on different parts of my feet, if I tried to push off the ground, if I tried to land on the ground, if I bent my knees more, if I bent my knees less, all these different things. I was just so, so fascinated by what it felt like having my bare feet getting all that information transmitting that to my brain and my brain giving me ideas of what to do with my body to see what would happen. So at the end of this run, I turned to a woman who had a GPS watch on and said, how far was that? And she said, "Uh, that was a little over 5k. (laughs) I was like, what? I could not believe it. I could have kept going, frankly. It's just that we finished the run, but I was having a blast. Anyway, a couple minutes later, I'm getting in my car, and I notice that I have a giant blister on the ball of my left foot. Not on the ball of my right foot, just the ball of my left foot. Now, here's the first interesting thing for me. Many people that I bump into in this situation will say things like, oh, well, this is clearly horrible for you because I got a blister. Um, I had the exact opposite response. My thought was, this is interesting. My right foot is fine. What was my right leg doing that my left leg wasn't? How was my right leg better than my left leg? And it wasn't lost on me that my left leg was the one that got injured more often. And this, again, those first couple years of uh, running, when I got back into sprinting, I was just getting injured all the time. So this was interesting to me. A week later, we go out for our second barefoot run, and I think to myself, all right, if I can find a way to run where I'm not causing pain on the gaping hole that's still on the ball of my foot, then I'm probably not doing the thing that caused that problem to begin with. So I'll give it 10 minutes. We'll see what happens. Uh, If it doesn't get any better, I'll stop and I'll wait for a week or two till everything heals. Then we'll try again. So nine minutes and 30 seconds of excruciating pain later, I was just about to call it in. And then something changed. Literally within one step, the pain went away my running felt easier, my body felt better, I was breathing more easily, just everything changed. And I'll tell you what happened in a second. All I know is in that moment, uh, uh, it was just an epiphany. It was just this incredible experience where suddenly everything felt different. And so I spent the next couple weeks 
practicing that same thing, just getting that feeling in my body of whatever it was that I had done differently and just sticking with it, just getting used to that. Well, my injuries went away. My running got better and faster. I became a master's all-American sprinter. Um, What that means is for men at that time over 45, I guess now over 55, um, I'm one of the fastest 100-meter guys in the country. Uh, And technically for men over 55, you could be looking looking at or listening to the fastest Jew in the world. Um, Not a lot of competition for that one, I'll concede. Anyway, so this blister was massively important. It taught me how to run better. And this is a thing that I want to communicate first, is that when you have certain kinds of problems, and I'll get more specific in a moment, they can be your best coaches, your best teachers, your best lessons. If you think of them that way, if you look at it with a kind of curious mindset of, all right, so what just happened? Why did it happen? And now what to do about it? So let me tell you what happened, and then I'll tell you what to do about it. Yeah, that sounds good. So the simple thing is a lot of people think, especially when it comes to barefoot running, that blisters and calluses are just par for the course. That's what you do. You need to toughen up your feet. You're going to get blisters, then you're going to get calluses, then your feet will be tough, and then you can run. Uh, let me just say right off the bat, that is 100% complete bullshit. So blisters are optional. Calluses are definitely proof that you need to change something about your form. And the simple reason why is that both of those, blisters first, then calluses, are caused by applying too much friction, applying too much horizontal force. If you just think about lifting your foot off the ground and putting it down on the ground, just lifting it straight up and straight down, you could pretty much do that all day long and you wouldn't get blisters or calluses. But once you start applying force, that's when you can get the abrasion and the the friction that's going to cause those two effects on your skin. And where that force can come from is one of two places. Uh, Either one, if you're landing with your foot too far in front of your body, especially if you're landing on the ball of your foot because you've been told that you're supposed to land on the ball of your foot, but you still reach out so your foot is landing in front of your body, you're essentially putting the brakes on. Uh, you're, You're causing um, your momentum to slow down and your foot is the thing that's taking the brunt of that. That typically results in calluses around the ball of your foot. The other place you often can find, not often, but you'll sometimes find people getting calluses is on the the, um, pads of their toes. And that comes from the backside. That comes as you're lifting your foot off the ground by kind of flexing your feet down, flexing your toes down, or trying to push off or toe off, rather than thinking about lifting your foot by uh, initiating that at the hip, by flexing your hip. Here's a, a good image to use. If you stepped on a bee in your bare feet, you wouldn't push down further to embed that stinger in your foot, you would try to lift your foot off the ground with a reflexive action that starts with your hip. You want to have that same kind of feeling when you're running as well. The other thing that's related to this is just where your body is, uh, how your body is aligned. So if you're loose in your core, if your butt is sticking back, uh, then that's going to make it a little more difficult to land properly and get your foot on and off the ground properly as well. So you want to have your core engaged. And what that means, a good way of playing with this is... Uh, Think about them as you're running or walking. Imagine that you have to brace yourself for somebody hitting you in the stomach. So that way we tighten everything up. You make a nice tight spring. Now, you don't want to do that forever because you can't breathe very well that way. But just to kind of get that feeling of what it means to engage those muscles around your core to make yourself a nice tight spring, get your hips over your feet, your shoulders over your hips. Um, Those two things will make it harder for you to overstride or to push off on the back as well. That's what I spontaneously did in that 9 minute and 30 second mark is suddenly, I don't know why, I think it was because basically I was in so much pain, my brain started trying to find a way to get out of it. And that was the thing that it spontaneously and unconsciously found was get my hips over my feet, get my shoulders over my hips, nice tight core. And that's what I remember it feeling like, which is that I just became a better spring. Now, when I say spring, I don't mean that you bounce up and down a lot because that's not good, but just that you're, because you're actually absorbing some of that um, shock with your, the muscles, ligaments, and tendons that you have in your legs, hips, feet, etc. But a nice tight spring is just one that reacts acts well and quickly rather than being slinky like and slow to respond you know just compressing and extending with every step so that's the gist of what uh, causes blisters I'm sorry let me say that slightly differently so that 
excessive horizontal force, that excessive friction, uh, that'll cause blisters, that'll eventually lead to calluses. That's not a good sign. So the whole idea is that you can use these things as a teacher. When you're, when you're running or walking, you want the feedback that you get to inform how you move. And here's the best part about my blister. It happened on one foot. I love unilateral injuries. I, well, not love them. Uh, and I just like unilateral phenomenon. Let's say it that way. Because like I said, most people will think, oh, what happened wrong on the foot that is hurting? And I was thinking, what happened right on the foot that was doing well? And in fact, when I was doing that second run, what I was paying attention to was not, does this hurt? But I was paying attention to why doesn't this right foot hurt. And that's what I'm going to recommend to you as well. If you have something going on that's unilateral, think about, pay attention to, experiment with the good side. And when you do that, the quote bad side will often come along for the ride and figure out what to do differently. There's a, if some of you might know, there's a bodywork method called Feldenkrais. And that's one of the principles in Feldenkrais, is work on the good side and figure out how that feels, how that moves. And then the bad side can come along for the ride. And I wasn't doing that consciously, but that's just what happened because it was just so, I was so curious. Why is this good side good? Uh, and then the bad side suddenly became good as well. So, oh, you know, we didn't do a movement at the beginning. So I'm going to, I was about to say, so I want to encourage you to ponder what your body is doing, use that information as the appropriate feedback, pay attention to the good side, and if there's not a good side, just experiment. Just try something different. And, and you know, one thing you might want to try, try to make it worse. Try to do things where whatever problem you're having is exacerbated. Thank you, SAT prep school testing process back when I was 17. I love the word exacerbated. I think actually if I used exacerbated and ameliorated in the same uh, paper in English, I got an automatic A. I think Sam, Sam Miller taught me that one. Thank you, Sam Miller. It got me an A in English, one of the classes I didn't like very much. Uh, but we found a way to get around it. Anyway, point being, see what you can do to make things worse. Exaggerate the problem because that'll actually help you figure out what really is going on. And that might allow you to make the changes that could be the kind of things that lead to a solution. So before we go, uh, we normally start the Movement Movement con podcast with a movement, and I totally forgot to do that. So I want to do one now. And this is one you can do in your car. You can do walking, standing, running, what it doesn't matter, because it's an internal movement. It's one that takes no actual motion, and it's just a subtle little thing. So what I want you to do right now is check in your body and see if you can find anywhere that feels stressed, that feels tight, that feels unpleasant in some way. It could be in the pit of your stomach, could be in your chest, could be in your throat, could be in your head somewhere. Just see if you can feel that. And then see if you can sense in some way how the reason that you can feel that is because there's something holding. It's almost like there's something encasing that feeling, that tension, that stress. And see if you can subtly just feel like you're the one holding that in place somehow. doesn't matter why, and I'm not suggesting there's a problem with this, but see if you can feel it in the same way that you would be having to contract your hand around a ball if you were holding a ball in the air. In fact, you can actually do that with your hand. You can make a fist or you can hold it like you're, you know, in the claw position as if you're holding on to something. And just see if you can feel how that stress is being held in your body in the same way that your hand would have to hold that ball and keep it from doing what it naturally wants to do, so just succumb to gravity and drop to the ground. And when you can feel that, at a certain point, it might feel like it's just a waste of energy and a waste of time to keep holding on. It just might be tiring to hold on like that. And in the same way you could just drop a ball from your hand, just let go of whatever's holding that stress, that tension in place, and then rest in whatever shows up in place of that. Maybe it'll get tense again and you can just let go again. Maybe it'll just feel spacious and you can just enjoy that spaciousness. Maybe it will seemingly move. And I say seemingly because just because if you feel something in a different spot, that doesn't mean it's the same thing that moved. It just now you're feeling something in a different spot. And you might want to play with this for the next few minutes. Just keep finding those little bits of tension and just see how you may be holding that in place for some reason. Who cares why? And then just like dropping a ball from your hand, a brick from your hand, just let it go and enjoy the rest that happens after that. 
That's our movement for the day. So I want to thank you for being part of this episode of the Movement Movement Podcast. Again, if you want to follow us and share and join and be part of creating natural movement as a as a movement, making natural movement the obvious, healthy, better choice, the way natural food currently is, join us over at jointhemovementmovement.com. That's where you can find all the links to all the various places that we do what we do. And you can like and subscribe and share and friend and follow and uh, hit the bell on YouTube, all those different things. If you have any questions, or any suggestions or anybody you think should be on the Movement Movement podcast, then you can just drop us an email at move at jointhemovementmovement.com. Until then, thank you so much and live life feet first.